So welcome everyone. My name is Margot Gia and I work for Wyndham Regional Commission. And I'm also very lucky to be on the steering committee for the Green River Watershed Alliance. The Green River Watershed Alliance currently services and is compromised of uh, residents and um, town representatives from three communities on the Vermont portion of the Green River watershed. That is the towns of Marlboro, Halifax, and Guilford. We're also very excited that there is a growing group of residents on the Massachusetts portion of the Green River watershed who are also very engaged and um, we have been collaborating on a few activities and look forward to continuing to work watershed wide. So tonight's program is part of a beaver education series that we were lucky enough to be able to fund through a watershed grant through Vermont Fish and Wildlife. We also, the earlier programs, we worked with Patty Smith, who you'll be meeting tonight, um, who works for Bonnyvale Environmental Education Center, as well as Skip Lyle, who works for Beaver Deceivers International. And uh, through Patty's connections, we are very lucky to be able to host um, Ben Goldfarb here tonight. And Patty's going to talk a little bit more about um, beavers in the Green River watershed and then introduce Ben. We're going to ask this evening that you hold your questions till the question and answer period after Ben has a chance to speak. If you want to put, you know, if something pops into your head and you want to put that in the chat, I will be monitoring the chat. And so we will make sure that those questions get addressed and asked during the question and answer period. So um, feel free to uh, type into the chat and we can utilize that as a way to help us remember some things and trigger some questions for later in the program. So Patty, I'm gonna, oh, one last little housekeeping thing. We're gonna ask that everybody keep themselves on mute during the program, unless you were asking a question and then you can hit unmute to unmute yourself. Uh, that way we can eliminate any background noises while our presenter is speaking. So Patty, you wanna? Yeah, happy to. Uh, one other thing, Margo, can you make Ben a host? Have you done that already? I haven't, but I will make him a co-host also. I think that will affect how it's recorded, which would be good. So I, I have uh, been a big fan of beavers for many years, as which will not come as a surprise to many of you. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am to see so many beaver believers joining us tonight. Um, I live in the Green River watershed and have been studying a colony of beavers out here in my backyard in the watershed for the past 12 years and have learned an awful lot about them. I've also been working with the Green River Watershed Alliance on a biodiversity inventory of the watershed. And one of the things that I find most interesting is that in the Southern part of the watershed, it's very steep and rumply and calcium rich and it's lower elevation and drier and you have a completely different flavor down there. You have very few wetlands, you have a lot of rich ledgy sites and sugar maple forests. Up here in the headwaters of the Green River watershed, it's colder and wetter and flatter and it is just perfect for beavers. And they have moved right back in since the 1960s and have created so many different wetlands. And that is what really contributes to the diversity in this the headwaters portion of the watershed. So hooray for beavers. And um, Ben came out and met some of my beaver friends one evening, one very long, very dark evening. I hope your wife managed to forgive you, Ben. <laughs> we were out so late. Um, anyway, I, I am very, very pleased to introduce Ben Goldfarb. He has done tremendous things for elevating awareness of beavers in this country with his great book, Eager. So that said, I'm just going to, I'm just going to turn it over to you and let you go, Ben. Okay, fantastic. Well, th thank you for that introduction. Thanks, Marco, for having me. And thanks to Patty for inviting me. And, you know, Patty is 
Patty is, is operating in a kind of a wonderful tradition, um, you know, that began with writers like, like Dorothy Richards and Hope Ryden, you know, people who have really spent um, an enormous amount of time observing these wonderful animals. I think of Patty as being one of the true, the true experts and authorities on, on, uh, on beaver behavior and colony dynamics. And uh, I, I love your book so much. And I was really uh, delighted to be invited, invited by you. Um, and I, as for me, I live, I live in, uh, in Spokane, Washington, I'm in Eastern Washington, uh, but I grew up in New York State and uh, lived for, for many years in, uh, in New England. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I'll be talking tonight a, a bit about beavers in sort of the Western context. I know you've heard from people like Patty and Skip, who I'm sure have uh, you know, really gotten you up to speed on beavers in, in New England. But you know, out here in the West, of course, we have a very different uh, kind of landscape and different ecosystems uh, and beavers are, are sort of doing different interesting things um, that I'll, I'll be talking about. Um, so tonight I'll be, I'll be talking a lot about beavers as restoration tools. How can we work with and even sort of deploy these animals um, to achieve various ecological goals? But before I talk about using beavers, you know, I think it's important to establish a few basic facts about beavers. And I know that you know, a lot of people in this audience are, are of course, beaver believers and are probably um, very, very uh, knowledgeable when it comes to basic beaver biology and ecology. But, you know, a little refresher probably never hurts. Um, so, of course, beavers, you all know, are, are rodents. Uh, they're North America's largest rodent, you know, 40 to 50 pounds is kind of a, a good sized adult, adult beaver. So they're pretty hefty animals. Um, and of course, they're semi-aquatic rodents, right? So they spend pretty much all of their lives in and around water. Uh, and they've got a few really incredible adaptations for that, that kind of unique semi-aquatic niche they fill. Uh, of course, they've got extraordinarily dense fur. Uh, they've got as many individual hairs on a, on a kind of a postage stamp size patch of skin as we have on our entire heads. So remarkably thick, luxurious pelts, which were, of course, their, their downfall. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, they've got these webbed duck-like hind feet, very powerful, uh, agile swimmers. They can stay underwater for up to 15 minutes. So they're, they're champion breath holders. Uh, they've got a second set of eyelids called nictitating membranes, which are transparent goggles, essentially. So they can see underwater very well. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, as well as kind of a second set of lips, uh, this kind of fur-lined valve almost that they can close behind their front teeth so they can chew and drag branches underwater without drowning. I think that's a, a really cool adaptation. Uh, and then what's, what's a, a beaver's most iconic defining feature? What makes a beaver recognizably a, a beaver and not a muskrat? Uh, the tail, of course, right? And the tail is this wonderful kind of multi-purpose appendage. Uh, it's, it's a fat storage device. They actually put on fat for the winter in their tails. It's a rudder while they swim. It's a kickstand out on land. Uh, and of course, it's, a, it's an alarm system as well. Right? I'm sure that many of you have heard the smack uh, of a beaver's tail hitting the water. And they do that to warn other beavers about the, the presence of predators. The tail is doing all kinds of, uh, performing all, all kinds of interesting functions. Uh, and then the other wonderful beaver feature is their teeth. Uh, beavers, as you can see, they're kind of their top and bottom incisors basically file each other down into these nice uh, chisel-like points. Um, and the, the beaver's teeth are orange because they're, they're chemically and structurally fortified with iron uh, that beavers derive from their food. Uh, and that's, that's really important, having very durable uh, iron-enriched teeth when you spend your entire life cutting down trees, right? Uh, beavers eat cambium, which is the inner bark uh, of, of trees. Um, you know, out here in the West, willow, aspen, uh, cottonwood, those are kind of the big three, but they'll take, you know, pretty much any uh, deciduous tree. They do tend to avoid conifers. Um, you know, scientists call them choosy generalists. They've got a few species of tree that they prefer, but, you know, they'll, they have pretty broad diets and they eat lots of, you know, green uh, leafy vegetation as well, you know, forbs and cattails and water lilies. And, you know, I've seen them basically mow people's lawns for them. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, as Patty can attest, they love apples. They have a kind of interesting fondness for apples. Uh, so of course, in it, when they when they fell trees, in addition to eating the cambium, the inner bark, they're also using the wood as construction material, right? And beavers uh, build two basic structures. Um, the first is, of course, the lodge, uh, which is kind of a fundamental beaver housing unit. Uh, you can sort of see this. This is a lodge in Colorado. You can sort of see that there are underwater tunnels that lead up into the lodge. Inside the lodge, you've got kind of an elevated 
very nice, dry, warm, uh, kind of a nesting platform. Um, and a typical beaver colony or family is two to as many as eight or so beavers. And you've got you know, the male and the female, uh, the newborn kits, the baby beavers, the one-year-olds and the two-year-olds. So at times during the year, you've got three year classes of offspring all, all kind of cohabitating together in the lodge. And then those two-year-olds will disperse out, you know, like teenagers uh, heading off for, for college to find their own territory. So in addition to the lodge, you have the dam, right? That's the other classic beaver structure. So why do beavers build dams? What's the point of performing this really unique, specialized behavior that no other animal really does? Well, a beaver out on land uh, is a slow, smelly, fat package of meat, right, as one biologist uh, put it to me, uh, and they get eaten, you know, out here in, in eastern Washington, we've got cougars and wolves, you know, of course, you guys have coyotes and black bears, really any large carnivore uh, is going to very happily try to take a beaver. Uh, so by building that dam and creating this nice deep pond, uh, they're basically expanding the extent of their own habitat, right, their own shelter. Uh, so instead of having to, you know, walk over land, that good looking aspen tree and risk being eaten along the way, they can swim to it instead, cut it down, float it back uh, to, the, to the lodge. So they're, you know, they're really expanding and, and enhancing their own habitat. Uh, and here's a, the, uh, a piece of a beaver that I, I found in Minnesota. Um, this is kind of a classic wolf predation. Wolves actually eat the entire beaver. Uh, you know, they digest bones, pelt and all, and just leave behind uh, the mandible and the, the lower incisors. Uh, so the, the, point of the, the point of this picture is that you don't want to be a beaver on land, right? You want to stay in the water. This is what, this is what happens to terrestrial beavers. So a typical beaver colony or family, uh, you know, is building, in some cases, you know, 12 to 15 dams. There's usually one big primary dam that creates, you know, the main impoundment, the main pond, uh, and a number of secondary dams. I'll also add, you know, beavers don't always build dams, right? They sometimes, they, they, they're very fond of living and just burrowing into riverbanks and living in big lakes and rivers where there's plenty of water depth already. Um, you know, here in Spokane, you know, the Spokane River is full of beavers. Uh, it's, you know, it's far too big for any beaver to ever dam, but they're, you know, they're living very happily in the banks. So I'll just, you know, that's, that's, I think that's one popular misconception, you know, is if you don't see a beaver dam, there must not be any beavers, but, you know, they're often, they're often living in the banks very happily and inconspicuously. Um, but, you know, in these kind of higher order tributaries, um, you know, these, these smaller streams toward the headwaters, you know, they are building lots of dams in many cases, and, and those dams come in an, an array of shapes and sizes. Um, here's a little dam in Montana, you know, that's pretty typical. This is maybe, uh, you know, three feet long and, and one foot high, um, but they do get quite a bit bigger. Uh, here's a, a pretty impressive uh, primary dam in Minnesota um, that's maybe 14 or 15 feet tall and, and possibly uh, 800 feet long or so. And is obviously the work of many successive generations of beavers, uh, all adding their, their stick to the pile. So in the right situations, they can do some pretty spectacular things. Um, and here's, you know, I'm, I'm always impressed by their kind of their hydrological savvy. You know, I, I often feel like if you took, you know, a, an engineer from the Army Corps uh, and said, okay, build a dam in a situation where you can, you know, you can minimize labor and maximize the total impoundment, the total, you know, amount of land underwater. That, that Army Corps engineer would choose the exact same spot that the beavers do. Uh, you know, so here's, here's a, a really spectacular impoundment of probably 300 acres or so uh, that's formed by a strategically, a single strategically located beaver dam, uh, which I think is pretty, pretty impressive. And the other important bit of beaver engineering that, you know, we don't talk about enough, I think, is their, their canal digging. Uh, you know, they dig these, in some cases, these really elaborate networks of canals up into the forest uh, that can extend, in some cases, hundreds of feet. And again, you know, the point there, too, is to, you know, they're basically making it easier for themselves to get around, right? They can swim up that canal, cut down a tree, you know, float the limbs back down to the pond uh, without, without leaving the water. And these, you know, these little canals are, are really good habitat in their own right. You, know, you often see baby fish and amphibians, tadpoles, uh, hanging out in those canals. So I think, you know, we talk a lot about beaver dam building, but maybe not enough about canal digging, which is a really important way in which they, they modify the landscape. 
So, you know, you put it all together and, and here's, here's what it looks like. Here's a, a really uh, spectacular beaver complex. This is also in Colorado. This is up, uh, this is basically at the Continental Divide. So this is about 12,000 feet in elevation. Uh, they really get way the, way the heck up there. Uh, and you can see, you know, the stream just kind of comes, you know, meandering along through that, that, that valley. And then it hits all of these, you know, these linear features here, these beaver dams. Um, and, you know, this, those beaver dams are, are capturing and storing, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of gallons of water in this little valley uh, and, you know, and really irrigating um, quite a, a, large, uh, a large expanse and keeping water up in the, the headwaters, um, which is really important from a kind of a drought mitigation standpoint. We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Uh, but here's a really nice illustration, I think, of how dramatically beavers take this little simplified, you know, single thread meandering channel and turn it into this you know, incredibly complex dynamic wetland complex. So beavers, you know, beavers are uh, what scientists call a, a keystone species, right? Just, just as, as a, you know, in, in architecture, the top block uh, in a, a, a stone arch is supporting a lot of weight. You know, beavers are disproportionately supporting ecosystems, right? We know that water is life, especially in the, the arid American West where I live. Uh, and any animal that's capable of capturing and creating more water uh, is really important, right? So beavers are engineering their own habitat, but in the process, they're creating habitat for lots of other critters as well. Uh, here's a, a really nice uh, great blue parrot rookery uh, at a, a beaver complex in Wisconsin. Uh, so, you know, we know that all kinds of wading birds, waterfowl, even songbirds, you know, passerines love hanging out around beaver complexes. They eat the, the aquatic insects that emerge off the water. They perch in those, you know, kind of coppicing willows that beavers create. So you really, I mean, of course, you know, I'm sure many of you are birders. Where do you go birding? You go birding in wetlands, right? Um, and beavers, you know, beavers create these wonderful bird habitats. Uh, we know that lots of other semi-aquatic mammals, you know, moose, uh, mink, muskrat, otters, uh, all, all love hanging out around beaver complexes. Here's a, a moose uh, enjoying a, a beaver colony in, in uh, Utah. Um, and then here's a, a really nice, uh, you know, illustration of, of some kind of surprising beaver habitat connections. This is um, another pond in, or a former pond uh, in Minnesota. And what happened here, you can sort of see, you know, the old uh, beaver dam back here in the background. You know, the beavers left the area for whatever reason. Uh, the dam broke down, the pond drained, so you get this beautiful, you know, lush um, kind of wet meadow that's really good forage for, you know, for moose and deer and other, other ungulates. Um, but in this case, you know, you can see the beaver lodge in that pond drain, you know, the lodge was basically left high and dry. Uh, and in this case, a, a pack of wolves actually moved into that lodge and raised their pups inside the lodge. So that's beavers creating habitat for their direct predator. I think that's that's really incredible. So the, you know, these beaver connections just happen in all kinds of surprising ways. Uh, and then you know, out, out west, uh, you know, really the most important beaver beneficiary from a kind of a management standpoint are salmonids, right? Trout and salmon. Uh, you know, if you're if you're a baby, if you're a baby trout or salmon, like this little steelhead, uh, you know, you don't want to live in the, the main fast flowing river, right? That's where you're gonna get blown downstream. You want to hang out in a you know a deep side channel or a pool or a, an eddy or a meander, you know, you want that complex, slow water, kind of brushy habitat where you can hang out and save your energy and be safe. And that's exactly the kind of habitat, of course, that beavers create. So, you know, here there's just, I mean, there's, you know, there are literally billions of dollars being spent on, on salmon habitat restoration uh, in, in Washington and Oregon. And, you know, increasingly a lot of that money is flowing towards, towards beaver reintroduction, which is really exciting. Uh, and of course, you know, in, in Vermont, you don't have uh, you don't have steelhead or, or acidic salmon like we do, but you know, brook trout are, are obviously your kind of salmonid of concern. And uh, here's a really beautiful brook, brook trout that I, I pulled out of a, a beaver pond. And I've you know, I've just talked to so many fishermen over the years who've said I caught my, including Skip Lyle, um, you know, I, I caught my uh, the biggest the biggest the biggest brook trout of my life in a beaver pond. And uh, I can I can say the same thing. And uh, so, of course, you know, one common objection that you do hear from, from fish biologists sometimes about, you know, this beaver salmon connection is, you know, wait a second, we're trying to take dams out of rivers right now, right? Not put more dams into rivers. These are migratory fish that need to get upstream. And, you know, aren't beavers going to block them from doing that? But, you know, of course, a, a beaver dam is nothing like 
uh, a human built dam, you know, fish uh, can jump over beaver dams, they can swim around them during high periods of flow, they can wriggle through the, the woody structure of the dam. And uh, here's a, a really nice illustration of the point, I think this is a, a little beaver pond outside of Seattle that I visited a few years ago. And here you can see, here's the beaver, here's the beaver dam, here's the upstream, uh, the upstream side, the pond, uh, and here are the two freshly dug salmon reds or nests. So at least two fish had no problem whatsoever surmounting this, uh, this beaver dam. You know, and in fact, the, the evolutionary connection between beavers and salmon is so deep that it inspired my favorite bumper sticker, uh, which is that beavers taught salmon to jump. I think that, that, that gets at the relationship really nicely. So how many beavers lived on this continent historically? That's something that, you know, that, uh, that ecologists and, and geomorphologists debate a lot. How many beavers did we have um, prior to European arrival? Just how ubiquitous or abundant were these animals? Uh, so we don't really know, uh, but in the best estimates that, that are out there, uh, suggest that we had as many as 400 million beavers uh, in North America pre-European pre contact. And today, you know, again, we don't really know how many there are, uh, you know, maybe 10 to 15 million uh, are the best estimates I've heard. So they're not, you know, they're not an endangered species, right? They're, you know, they're, they're not going to go extinct anytime soon. Um, but, you know, they're at a very small fraction of their, their historic abundance, right? We have a, a tiny percentage of the beavers we used to have uh, in, in North America. Uh, you know, there are as many as 150 to 250 million beaver ponds uh, on this continent at, at one point. And uh, a little back of the envelope math suggests that maybe they had 235,000 square miles uh, impounded, which, you know, for reference is basically the size of Arizona and Nevada put together. Uh, so just a, you know, an enormous amount of this, this continent was once underwater, uh, thanks, to, thanks to beavers. And, you know, I think a really important point to emphasize is that you know, going back many thousands of years, native people had a, a really intimate relationship with beavers. You know, we talk, uh, you know, we talk a lot now about, you know, the, the ecological value of beavers, you know, why it's important to have them in the landscape. But that's obviously not a, a realization that's original to Western science, right? Of course, native people have understood that for a very long time. Uh, and in fact, you know, out West, uh, a lot of native tribes actually had cultural prohibitions against killing beavers. They, they, they sanctified beavers because they understood uh, how important these animals were in creating these little wet ecological oases in an otherwise dry landscape. And you know, that's, that's uh, the reason that, you know, that um, trappers like you know, Jim Bridger and Kit Carson and Hugh Glass, you know, all these famous mountain men uh, in the early 1800s, the reason those guys had to go be trappers um, was because, you know, unlike Eastern tribes, Western tribes refused to participate in the fur trade because they, you know, they had these, these cultural prohibitions against killing beavers. So because, because they understood how important they were from a water standpoint in the arid West. So I think that's a, you know, just an important thing to remember is that, you know, this knowledge that beavers are, are keystone species and ecosystem engineers, you know, that goes back many, many thousands of years. Uh, and you know, a lot of what I, I tried to do in working in this book was just go back through old, you know, trappers' journals, explorers' diaries, railroad survey reports, just trying to understand, you know, what North America looked like with its its full complement of beavers. And there's no question this was once a, a much greener, bluer, wesher, wetter, lusher continent. You know, you read accounts of explorers uh, crossing the state of what is today Indiana, you know, not finding a dry place to camp for a hundred miles because beavers had so thoroughly ponded everything up. You know, Lewis and Clark talk about seeing beaver dams uh, in every tributary of the Missouri River, you know, as far as the eye could see uh, up, up, to, up into the mountains. So, you know, these animals were once just absolutely everywhere in, in, uh, in numbers, population numbers that really boggle the mind, I, th I think. Of course, you know, not, not uh, long after Lewis and Clark made that journey, beavers met their downfall, right? In fact, it's, it's kind of notable, you know, this Lewis and Clark made this trip up the Missouri River, you know, on their, on their way out west uh, in, in 1805. In 1843, uh, John James Audubon, this, the naturalist and painter, traveled the exact same route and couldn't find a single beaver, you know, in a watershed where they'd once been absolutely ubiquitous um, because, you know, in less than 40 years, uh, they'd all been turned into hats, right? 
Uh, you know, I think that sometimes we hear the phrase beaver hat uh, and think of like a big fluffy, you know, Davy Crockett type thing, but you know, beaver hats are actually these kind of elegant Victorian style top hats that were uh, all, the, all the rage back in Europe. Uh, and the fur trade begins in the early 1600s in, in New England, uh, you know, in Connecticut and Rhode Island, uh, gets to Vermont pretty quickly. Uh, and then, you know, just rapidly spreads west and south across, across the continent. Uh, you know, fur traders and trappers just eliminating beavers from every single pond, river, lake, wetland they see. Uh, and, you know, the, the fur trade, you know, by the 18 teens or 20s or so has, you know, has really reached the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Coast. Uh, and by 1850 or thereabouts, you know, beavers are, are functionally extinct uh, in, in the United States. Uh, and, you know, it's really hard to overstate the extent to which, you know, this, this beaver trade, this rapacious pursuit of beaver pelts was, you know, this just defining crucial historical event uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, along with timber and cod, beavers were the most important economic resource that, that European colonists found in the, the quote unquote new world. Uh, you know, here's the, the official seal of the city of New York. Uh, and there, there are a couple of uh, a couple of beavers in it, uh, in testament to how many beavers went down the Hudson River uh, out, of, out of New England and, and upstate New York. Uh, here's a, a, a beaver coin. So, so the Oregon Territory historically encompassed most of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and in 1849, the Oregon Territory minted uh, a beaver coin whose value was fixed to the value of one beaver pelt. So the entire currency of the Northwest, the early Northwest, operated on, on the pelt standard. The, the, the currency was pegged to the value of beavers. I think that's uh, a pretty uh, amazing testament to what a, a significant historical event this was. Uh, and of course, you know, it was, it was also uh, a devastating event in the colonization of North America, right? It was, you know, it was those beaver trappers and traders who spread smallpox and many of the other diseases that, you know, so ravaged native people. So, you know, the story of the fur trade is really the story of, you know, early American history and all of its kind of grandiosity and, and tragedy. So in addition to being a, a hugely significant historical event, the, the beaver trade was a, a huge ecological event as well, as well, right? I mean, what happens when you kill, you know, 400 million beavers? Well, all of those beaver ponds, all of those dams break down and all of those ponds drain to the ocean. And in fact, you know, it, what's, what's really incredible to me is that uh, in the early 1600s, you know, when the fur trade began in New England, so many, so many beaver ponds drained to the ocean that it, it fertilized this enormous plankton bloom. So today, if you take a sediment core in Long Island Sound, you can see this layer uh, of, of diatoms, of phytoplankton, uh, that was fertilized by all of the nutrients rushing out of, of beaver ponds. I think that's just unbelievable that this was you know, such a huge geological event that it's written in the ocean floor itself. That's just re remarkable to me. Uh, and you know, I think an important thing to remember, too, is that you know, in some ways, the, the beaver trade made agriculture possible in New England, right? You know, Vermont, of course, and in New, all of New England, a lot of it is, you know, rocky, kind of infertile, uh, not the best, not the best growing conditions. Uh, and, you know, those beaver ponds, you know, those, those, they're, they're flat, they're treeless, they're loaded with nutrients. Uh, and, you know, for, I mean, those are the most valuable agricultural lands in, in, uh, in New England, where the, the footprints of these old beaver ponds uh, that had been cleared out by, by, fur traders and trappers. So, you know, the, the, the loss of beavers was sort of this devastating ecological event, but, you know, not, not too bad for the, for the, the colonists. Uh, so here's kind of a typical, you know, just thinking about what happened when we, when we lost all of those beavers, you know, here's a kind of a classic, um, kind of a classic case study of stream degradation, right? When you've got, you know, a, a beaver rich, healthy stream, you know, all of those beaver dams are acting as speed bumps, right? They're slowing water down, they're pushing it out onto the floodplain. Uh, and when you lose all of those beaver dams, there's nothing, there's nothing checking the velocity of water. So what you get in many cases is really dramatic, rapid erosion, right? The stream just cuts through its, you know, through its banks, and you know, you end up with this, this little incised ditch essentially that's totally disconnected from the floodplain. So, you know, a, a meadow like this would have taken thousands and thousands of years of, of you know, sediment accumulation to build up. Uh, and then, you know, as soon as you lose beavers, uh, you know, in a matter of years, you get this, this um, you know, this kind of this catastrophic disconnection from stream and, and floodplains. So this is a, you know, I think that we see this sort of image a lot, especially in the West. And we think, oh, you know, this 
this happened, this erosion happened because of mining or logging or grazing or some other historical impact. But in many cases, this is the result of, of the loss of beavers. And that, that's disastrous for all kinds of creatures. This is a boreal toad, um, which uh, we have out west here. And, and basically, it met, in much of its range, is an obligate beaver pond breeder, only breeds in, in beaver ponds. Uh, so of course, the loss of beavers would have been catastrophic for, uh, you know, for boreal toads. Um, and then you know, salmon, again, are sort of the, the prime case study. This is a coho salmon. Uh, and you know, in parts of Washington, the loss of coho, the loss of beavers uh, contributed to a 97% loss of, of coho salmon rearing habitat. There's nowhere for those baby, those baby salmon to grow up uh, in the absence of beaver ponds. So again, you know, I don't, I don't think we think about beaver trapping in the same terms as we think about, you know, mining or grazing or the deforestation of New England or, you know, the busting of the prairie as kind of this seminal ecological catastrophe. But, you know, in many ways, this was sort of the first harm uh, that Europeans uh, inflicted upon, upon North American landscapes. So, you know, again, by, the, by sort of the, the end of the 19th century, you know, beavers are, are functionally extinct in, in, uh, in the United States. Um, but, uh, you know, we fortunately we start, to, we start to wise up uh, around then, you know, various uh, state fish and game agencies begin to, uh, to you know, they put protections on beavers, they, you know, they, they change trapping regulations, uh, and they begin to reintroduce them, right? There's this sort of dawning awareness that, hey, you know, as, as uh, the naturalist Enos Mills put it, you know, a live beaver is, is more valuable uh, than a dead one. Uh, so, you know, lots of, lots of places have um, beaver reintroduction projects. Interestingly, a lot of the, a lot of the beavers uh, in New England, probably most of the beavers in New England, came from a, a beaver reintroduction uh, in New York, um, where basically the New York um, I guess it was the, D, the DEC at that point, uh, imported a bunch of beavers. Um, they imported some from Yellowstone. They bought some off the Canadians, uh, reintroduced beavers to the Adirondacks, and those, those animals kind of proliferated uh, and, and recolonized uh, a, lot of, a lot of New England. So, you know, in all likelihood, uh, at least some of the beavers that you see in Vermont are, are descended from ones that were introduced to, to New York. Um, the most famous beaver reintroduction project uh, which maybe you've heard of, happened uh, in Idaho, not too far from, from where I live. Uh, and there, you know, the Idaho Fish and Game Department wanted to reintroduce beavers um, to the wilderness. Uh, they, at first they tried moving them on horseback, and the beavers didn't, didn't uh, take too kindly to that, and neither did the horses. Um, but, you know, this is happening in 1948. It's just sort of post-World War II. They've got all of these surplus uh, airplanes and parachutes on hand. Uh, and one of these biologists has the bright idea um, of airdropping some, some beavers into the backcountry. Uh, so in 1948, they released 76 beavers uh, out of airplanes. Uh, 75 of those beavers survived. One beaver, unfortunately, uh, escaped from the crate in midair and fell to his death, very sad. Um, but the rest of them uh, made it. And uh, the next year, when, when these biologists flew back over that landscape, they saw beaver ponds and wetlands and all the places where they dropped beavers. So this is actually a, a kind of an incredibly successful uh, project for its, for its time. Nobody's air dropping beavers anymore, but that was what, that was, what was going on back then. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So all throughout the 20th century, right? Beavers are, they're being reintroduced to places where they were historically eliminated. Uh, you know, they're starting to reproduce. They're, they're kind of spreading back out across the landscape. Uh, but the only problem is that, you know, in their absence, we've colonized the best habitat, right? It turns out that good beaver habitat and good human habitat is one and the same. You know, we both like broad, fertile floodplains and low gradient stream corridors. You know, that's where we build all of our infrastructure and that's where beavers like to hang out. Uh, you know, I'd certainly argue that we're the, the nuisance species more than, more than they are. Um, but, you know, there's no question that, uh, you know, that, that when beavers and humans overlap, they can be hard to, hard to uh, you know, they can create hard conflicts to reconcile it at times. Um, here's a kind of a nice illustration of that point. Um, here's a set, this is a set of railroad tracks in Massachusetts uh, that they, at the time I took this picture, they had just been, the tracks had just been rebuilt. It was this kind of this big million dollar project. Uh, and within two months, you know, beavers had them, had them underwater. Uh, so that's the, the sort of thing that, that uh, beavers are capable of. Um, here's a, a nice picture. This is in, in uh, New Mexico outside of Taos. Uh, you can see that beavers have flooded this, this little cabin pretty nicely. 
Um, and I like this picture because what, what you can sort of see is that you know, so the beavers begin their dam uh, up in the top left corner of the screen. They dam up to the base of the cabin. Then they incorporate the cabin in the dam and they keep going on the other side. So that's, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be that landowner, but you have to kind of admire the, the ingenuity uh, of the beavers in this, this situation. Uh, probably the most common beaver conflict, as I'm sure Skip Lyle told you, is damming in road culverts, right? If you're a beaver, you know, the, the road bed is kind of this incredible potential dam and the culvert is the, the leak in the dam and beavers love plugging up leaks. Uh, that's what they what they do. Um, so, you know, you get this this sort of thing very frequently, right? The water level rises, the road washes out, uh, very expensive to, to maintain. Um, so that's probably the most common cause of beaver conflict, but they do get in more creative trouble. Uh, here's a beaver that broke into uh, a dollar store in Maryland and uh, was, was busted uh, while browsing the plastic uh, Christmas tree rack. So <laughs> they get into all kinds of all kinds of creative, creative mischief. Uh, of course, the way that these sorts of beaver conflicts are handled is generally by trapping out the offending beaver, uh, right, which makes a lot of sense. You know, the beaver's causing a problem, get the beaver out of there. Um, but, you know, the issue with that uh, is, is twofold. I mean, first, um, you know, when you eliminate those beavers, you're obviously eliminating the potential for that great, you know, pond and wetland habitat they create. Um, but also, you know, all you're doing is creating a, a vacancy sign for the next family of beavers, right? As long as this culvert is still there, you know, luring them in, they're always going to come back uh, and you get this, you know, kind of very expensive and, and uh, inhumane treadmill of trapping and, and recolonization and trapping and recolonization. And that's happening all over you know, the United States, right? And every year, the federal government, the agriculture department kills about 20,000 beavers. Um, and private nuisance trappers are killing, you know, certainly tens and probably hundreds of thousands of beavers more. So you start to wonder, well, you know, maybe there's some better way of, of doing business. And, you know, here's a, a really nice illustration of that point. I think this is, um, this is at a little lake in uh, Colorado where, you know, beavers had been gnawing on some, you know, these kind of beautiful old cottonwood trees that, you know, a local land trust wanted to protect. And, you know, I mean, every year there are thousands of beavers get killed for cutting down trees, right? Cutting down ornamental trees or people's apple trees or what have you. And I just don't think that a beaver should ever be killed for cutting down a tree, right? That's just too easy a problem to solve. Um, so here in this case, you know, they want to protect the, protect, protect the cottonwoods. They fenced those off. Uh, and then, you know, the, man, the local land managers here left unfenced these beautiful or not so beautiful uh, non-native Siberian elm trees which the beavers cut down. So that's, you know, that's invasive vegetation management using the beaver as your agent. I think that's, that's pretty creative. Uh, of course, you know, flooding is a, is a, a kind of a, a more difficult problem to solve, but you know, there too, you've got options. You guys have all heard from Skip Lyle, so I don't, I don't need to belabor this point, um, but you know, the beaver deceiver and other uh, kind of water management devices, flow devices, you know, can basically move water from one side of a, a road culvert or one side of beaver dam to the other, drop that, that pond level to a point, you know, that both humans and beavers can tolerate uh, and ideally, you know, kind of strike a balance between uh, people and, and rodent and, and manage that conflict non-lethally. Uh, here's a, you know, here's a pipe that we put in last year um, on a property out here in Eastern Washington. Um, and, you know, you can sort of see, I mean, this, you know, I think that Skip would, Skip would look at this and say, this is kind of a piece of crap. Uh, you know, Skip makes these, you know, these really beautiful sort of bespoke uh, devices. Um, this is a, you know, kind of a cheap knockoff basically. But, um, you know, you can see in this, in this picture, um, you know, this, at this point, you know, this pipe has been in for, you know, an hour or so, we, you know, we've already dropped the water level uh, about six inches. So here, you know, we had a landowner who was, uh, you know, just complaining about flooding on her property. She couldn't access all of her property. So we put in this device, drop the water level a little bit. And, uh, you know, a year later, the beavers are happy. She's happy. So, uh, so far, so good. And uh, here's, an, you know, another, this is another model. This is by a guy named Mike Callahan, who's a you know, great, one of Skip's protégés who lives in Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, what, what Mike has found is that these, these contraptions, these flow devices are, are effective 87 to 97% of the time. Um, so, you know, maybe not every situation uh, can be dealt with with a flow device, but, you know, there's no question that there are thousands and thousands of, of places all over the United States where we're currently killing beavers, uh, where we could be 
managing them or working with them non-lethally in, instead uh, if we exercised a, a little bit of forethought. Uh, the other option that uh, you know, we have, especially out here in Washington, is beaver relocation, right? Trapping, uh, live trapping nuisance beavers, uh, beavers causing problems in places where they're not wanted and you know, moving them to places where they are. Um, you know, that's, not, that's not done so much in New England just because you guys have uh, a fairly robust beaver population already. There just aren't as many unoccupied territories in New England as there are uh, out west. Um, you know, we, we just have a lot of streams that need beavers that don't have them now. Um, so, you know, it, I mean, Washington is probably the beaver relocation capital uh, of the United States. You know, we, we're, various groups are moving uh, hundreds of beavers every, every year. Um, here are two of them. This is uh, Sandy and Chomper, uh, a, nice, uh, a nice pair uh, bound for a new home uh, high up in the National Forest here in, here in Washington. Uh, of course, you're always trying to, you know, relocate families together, right? They're various, Patty can attest, they're incredibly family-oriented animals, um, you know, like to be with each other. So you're, you know, you're always trying to live trap and relocate the entire colony uh, together. You don't want to break up those families for sure. Uh, and, you know, the, the big issue with beaver relocation, the reason that, you know, it's not an ideal solution to conflicts is that, you know, when you move a beaver into a new area, you know, he or she doesn't have, she doesn't have her lot, she doesn't have her dam and her pond, um, you know, she's, she's kind of uh, at risk of predation. And there, you know, there have been uh, a few projects uh, out west that, you know, that, that are basically, you know, feeding the cougars, essentially, you know, just dropping beavers off and, and uh, seeing them devoured right away. So, you know, now what a lot of projects are doing are actually building these kind of starter lodges uh, that beavers can move into um, and, uh, and be, be safe. Uh, when they get dropped off. And these are pretty effective. And here's a, a beaver using his, uh, his, new, his new starter lodge. Uh, the other very popular restoration strategy out here is, is uh, beaver mimicry through the construction of, of um, beaver dam analogs, which are basically these human built beaver dams. And you know, that's, that's really uh, effective because you know, in many cases, right, when, you know, when beavers get eliminated from a stream, you know, that stream changes in ways that make it hard for beavers to come back, right? And you've got, you know, a really deeply eroded stream where, you know, the stream can't spill onto the floodplain. Well, you know, beavers can't really build a dam in that situation, right? The stream has been constricted into this fire hose and any dam just gets blown out by the flow of water right away. Um, so, you know, by, by pounding some posts into the stream bed, just giving them a little bit of structure, you know, you can, you can kind of induce them to settle in a place where they might not be able to, to settle otherwise. Uh, so this is a really, you know, really sort of helpful, low cost uh, restoration strategy for kind of, you know, re-beavering some of these systems that could really use beaver help. Um, kind of the famous case study where these beaver dam analogs were built is in, is in uh, Oregon on a stream called Bridge Creek, uh, where humans built uh, 115 of these things, of these beaver dam analogs. Uh, beavers showed up in mass and built uh, 120 dams of their own, uh, which was pretty exciting. Uh, the inundated area, so you know the amount of land underwater more than doubled, right? All of these beavers are just pushing water onto the floodplain. Um, all of these old side channels that had gotten dry are getting filled in again. Um, and uh, as a result of that, you know, the, the, the scientists who did this project saw a 50% increase in the survival of, of, uh, of baby steelhead, baby, baby trout. Um, so that's, you know, that's a 50% survival increase for, uh, you know, federally threatened species, uh, you know, it, it, thanks to a restoration project in which humans and beavers kind of collaborated uh, to restore this habitat. I think that's pretty, pretty cool. And again, here's, uh, you know, here's a, a nice little BDA, BDA, Beaver Dam Analog Project that, uh, a group that I'm involved in did here in Eastern Washington recently, where you know basically just pounding some posts into the stream bed, uh, taking some old ponderosa pine cuttings, and uh, you know basically building some structure uh, in a place where you know beavers were historically native, um, but haven't recolonized yet. Now we're hoping they will. So you know I've been talking a lot about sort of benefits for uh, you know for trout and moose and great blue herons and other, other species. But what about, you know, what about ecosystem services for humans? What do beavers do for us that we, that we, might, we might care about? And I know I'm kind of, kind of approaching time here, so I'll try to wrap it up pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, we know that they're incredible agents of stream restoration, right? And they're really good at drought mitigation too. You know, here in the West, it's very arid, especially with climate change. And, uh, you know, we know that beavers are really good at, at storing water, 
uh, and keeping it on the landscape. So here's you know, kind of the classic case study proving that um, occurred in, in northeastern Nevada uh, on a stream called Maggie Creek, uh, where you know, here basically beavers were long absent um, in large part because of, because of overgrazing, right? Cattle were eating all of the streamside vegetation, nothing for beavers to eat, so there were you know, no beavers. The stream was sort of eroding and you, know, you can see it's kind of this barren, lifeless channel, right? It looks like you're, you know, you're on Mars or something like that. Um, so in this case, you know, local ranchers and the, the government kind of worked together to implement some you know, very common sense grazing regulations to just, you know, let some of the, the willow and, and cattail regrow. Um, and as it did, you know, the beavers just showed up, you know, they have this kind of magical way of finding available habitat. Um, so this, is, this picture was taken in 1980. Uh, beavers started to come back around, around the year 2000 or so. Um, so here's the exact same stream uh, in 2017 after about 15 years of beaver recovery. So here's the, so just keep this picture in mind. And then check out this, right? That's pretty. That's pretty cool. That's a nice illustration of what beavers can do. Um, you know, you can see that all of this old, all of this cattail is just growth atop an old beaver dam. So they're really, you know, deeply embedded in this system. Uh, and basically, you know, what scientists found is that there were you know, 20 more acres of open water. So beavers just creating these wonderful ponds and marshes, uh, essentially on the on the landscape. Um, beavers added three miles of wetted stream length uh, to the channel, right? So what does that mean exactly? Well, basically, back when the stream looked like this, you know, it was so degraded. You know, come September, it's kind of the hot, the hot, dry season. So beavers took a, a seasonal stream and made it perennial. I think that's really incredible. And you, you hear a lot of stories about that. Um, all across all across the West. The other amazing thing is that uh, they saw a two foot increase in the water table, right? So when you've got a beaver pond, I mean, there's all of this visible surface water that, that you see. But what you don't see is the weight of that pond forcing water into the ground, recharging aquifers, you know, raising, raising the water table, hydrating the soil, irrigating plants. And in many cases, you know, beaver ponds are actually storing a lot more water underground uh, than they are, than they are in, in surface water. Um, so thanks to all of that, you know, that, that water storage, that soil hydration, uh, you know, beavers basically irrigated this entire valley. And, you know, scientists saw a hundred more acres of streamside vegetation thanks to beavers. So beavers acting as irrigators. Uh, and that's a big deal for this guy. This is James Rogers. He's one of the ranchers there in Northeast Nevada. And you know, the point that he made to me is that beavers, you know, basically increasing grass production tenfold for his cattle, uh, you know, which of course means more weight on his cows and more money in his back pocket. So, you know, now in, in Northeast Nevada, this very dry, uh, arid, conservative place, um, you know, there's kind of this wonderful progressive pocket of pro beaver ranchers who have really seen the, the benefits from these animals. Uh, the other incredible thing that beavers do that's really relevant to you in Vermont is that they slow down floods, right? So I think that's kind of the magical thing about beavers is that you've got, you know, drought on one end, flooding on the other end, you know, these two kind of polar opposite problems, but beavers by, you know, stabilizing flows help with both of them. So, you know, a big pulse of, of, uh, of runoff comes, you know, racing downstream and then it hits that beaver complex and it, you know, spreads out laterally or it's stored in the pond or it sinks into the ground, right? Beavers are just capturing enormous volumes uh, of water in their ponds and really mitigating uh, that, that flooding. So drought, flood, you know, these two opposite problems on the hydrograph that are both being exacerbated by climate change and beavers are helping us tackle both of them. Uh, another great thing that beavers do is they're great at capturing pollution, right? Uh, you know, you've got all of these suspended solids, you know, rushing along the water column. You know, you've got nitrates and phosphorus from ag agriculture. You know, in some places you've got, you know, heavy metals from mining. You've got all of this, you know, this sediment, what have you. And, you know, and then that, that water column hits that beaver pond, hits that beaver dam, slows down, and all of that stuff settles out. So they're really good at capturing pollution. Um, which is why, you know, there are groups in the Chesapeake Bay watershed uh, who are restoring, restoring beavers because, you know, they're trying to basically solve dead zone issues in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so that, you know, that, that uh, pollution capture benefit is a, a really big one. And they're, you know, they're great sequestering carbon too, right? All of this 
you know, organic matter. It's just, you know, it's like, it's like planting a tree, right? You're capturing beaver, you're capturing carbon, blue carbon uh, in, in beaver complexes. And then, you know, the other fabulous benefit that we care about so much out West uh, that we were talking about before the, before the talk started a little bit is they're great firefighters, right? They're, again, they're spreading water out of the landscape. Um, you know, they're basically creating these, you know, these blue, lush, wet pockets um, that, you know, that, that don't burn and are creating fire refugia, uh, essentially, where, you know, all of the critters can, can retreat uh, during a wildfire and then recolonize the landscape. And here's a, you know, great illustration of that. You can see all of these, this is in Idaho. Now um, you can see all of these kind of charred, blackened hill slopes. Uh, and, you know, the only green, wet, blue, lush place in the landscape is that, that beaver influenced uh, valley bottoms. They're just creating these wonderful fire breaks and fire refugia. So given all that, you know, why do we, why are we still so antagonistic toward beavers? Why do we still kill so many of them if, if we know how great they are? And, you know, to me, I think the issue is basically uh, one of, of ecological amnesia. You know, when we, when we killed 400 million beavers centuries ago, you know, we changed landscapes in ways that we don't fully understand. And I think we, you know, we internalized the notion of a healthy stream being this, you know, free flowing, fast moving, cobble bottomed, uh, you know, single threaded channel. Um, when in reality, you know, I think that uh, a lot of systems looked much more like this, right? Um, you know, beavers slowed water down, they killed a lot of trees, you know, it all kind of smells funky, like decomposition, you know, this isn't, I don't think this is really a, a picture that you would see, you know, in a fly fishing magazine, but we, we know that this sort of system, this kind of beaver influence system was historically more the rule than the exception. Um, so we have to get back to that point. We have to reconfigure our historical imaginations to recognize that, you know, beaver created habitats are really healthy and natural and normal. But, you know, the problem is that every time beavers show up somewhere, you know, we think of them as, as unnatural essentially because we have these very short time frames, right? Here's a, you know, here's a, a nice quote, I think, or not a nice quote, but a, a, an illustrative quote. Um, you know, after beavers returned to Staten Island in, in New York City, uh, you know, the, the landowners were all up in arms saying, you know, it was, it was never a lake before, you know, it had never flooded extensively before. Well, you know, certainly it hadn't in your very limited uh, lifespan, but, you know, you go back a thousand years and, uh, you know, beaver, again, beaver influence was much more exception than rule. So we just have to reconfigure our historical imaginations and kind of the baselines that we're using for, for what a, a healthy landscape should look like. So to sum it all up, we've got this wonderful animal, uh, provides all of these fantastic ecological services, both for us and for other, other organisms. It does it all for free. And best of all, it doesn't need permits. That's really nice too. So to sum it up, as the, the mantra of the, the beaver believer goes, time to step back and let the rodent do the work. Uh, I think that, that, that quote gets at the, 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 the gist really nicely. Um, so with that, I'll say, uh, you, I've got, I, I know I kind of went over uh, time there a little bit. Um, happy to take as many questions as you guys have. Uh, you know, also really delighted to be with Patty, who you know has probably forgotten more about beaver behavior than than I uh, will ever know. Um, you know, she can also answer your, your local beaver questions as well. Uh, I'll add that I did um, write a book about this stuff. Uh, there's my email address. I'll, I'll put that in the chat too. So if you're interested in a signed book, uh, I'd be very happy to send you one. And um, yeah, with that I'll, I'll stop talking and, and take some questions. So Ben, we've had um, a lot of incredible questions come through as you were in the chat as you were talking. So I'll just sort of start off with maybe a few of these questions. Um, a few people were really intrigued by your uh, mentioning of using beavers as a way to remove invasive species. And so a question came up, do they like buckthorn or honeysuckle or bittersweet? No, Patty, do they? <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm afraid they tend to be kind of fussy eaters and they don't like buckthorn. I don't know about honeysuckle or bittersweet, but they don't tend to go for uh, Japanese knotweed either. I have seen one pond where they, they ate some knotweed, but not, a, not very, if they have choices. So maybe not best uh, 
method for removing some of our invasives. But. Now, sadly, we still have to do the hard work. Uh, yeah. I will say that, that in, in Washington, they, they do they do tend to crush blackberry, which is you know which is which is non-native. They I mean, which is amazingly foreign. So they do they do they eat a lot of blackberry, um, which is which is cool. So another question that um, came through was. How do, do beaver deceivers affect upstream fish migration? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I know I know that, that that's being I know that, that Mike Callahan is actually I think he's he's commissioned some studies of that that question uh, now. So yeah, you know I think I think that the, it's a, it's a, a good question. I mean certainly um, you know I, I don't think that the, that fish would actually be using. Um, a, you know, a beaver deceiver or any flow device to migrate through. I think that, you know, the, probably the water, the water pressure and velocity is just, you know, it's just too, too powerful in their forum. Um, so it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's being studied now uh, and hopefully I'll, you know, I'll ask me again in a year or two and, you know, maybe we'll have some answers from, from Mike Callahan and his, his collaborators. So another question that came up was, how tolerant are beavers of human presence, trails, dogs, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, th I think that, you know, the, I mean, Patty's an amazing testament to the fact that they can, they can become incredibly tolerant, right? These are, you know, these are, these are uh, you know, trainable animals in, in some ways. I mean, I'll, I mean, I'll just say that, you know, it's, it's so variable, right? Depending on how much, at least in my experience, depending on how much exposure beavers have had to those things, um, you know, there's certainly, you know, there are lots of, of seen lots of colonies where, you know, if you get within, you know, a thousand feet of them, they start tail slapping like crazy. But, you know, that at the same time, there's, um, so I used to, I used to live in, in Northampton, Massachusetts, and, you know, there, uh, there's a, a place called, called Fitzgerald Lake that some of you may, may have been at some point. And Fitzgerald Lake has this, this enormous beaver lodge that, you know, according to some, some locals, goes back to the 1950s and has been kind of continuously occupied since then. Uh, it's a very public place, lots of, you know, lots of people, dog walkers, fishermen. Um, and, you know, you could, I mean, we would go there in, in the evening sometimes and people would actually stand on top of the beaver lodge uh, and, and fish for bass. And the beavers would be, you know, maintaining the lodge on the other side, not, you know, not 10 feet away from, from these anglers, you know, totally content because they had uh, habituated over over time really well so you know they yeah they, they can they can acclimate they've all got personalities I don't know Patty what do you what do you think about that question they do show up in all kinds of urban areas I think uh, human tolerance of the beavers is more the deciding factor in terms of where they will live right yeah and, you know yeah and the, and the, the I mean, the dog, the dog issue is a, also a, a, you know, a big question as well. I mean, that's, you know, in kind of in testament to what, what Patty's saying, I mean, certainly, you know, there, there have been a number of, a number of occasions where people, you know, let their dogs off leash, the dogs end up uh, attacking beavers in water, the beavers often win that fight, um, because they're, you know, they're, they're aquatic and the dogs aren't, uh, and then, you know, and then the dog, the dog owners complain and the beavers get tracked out because, you know, they, they would just had to happen to be where they were. So, um, yeah, dogs are definitely a big, a big beaver conflict for sure. So um, during the portion of the presentation when you talked about um, beaver ponds and flowages um, containing pollutants in the water, uh, someone asked, how do captured pollutants affect the beavers? Yeah, another another great question that nobody has that nobody has really studied that that would be fascinating. No, I mean I mean I'll just you know I, anecdotally I, I recently got some incredible pictures um, from a, a Bureau of Land Management uh, biologist in in, in Colorado um, who had basically uh, she she's been sort of observing for a long time this a, a beaver colony that had built a dam. Uh, and, and, a, and a lodge inside an old flooded mining shaft. Um, and the, the, the stream in this, in this mining shaft, you know, it, was, it was orange with you know, all kinds of heavy metals and old historic mining pollution, just like the, you know, the most disgusting stream you could imagine. You know, the beavers have been living there um, for, for, according to this woman, quite a, quite a while. Um, so you know, but the, the, maybe, they're, maybe they're tolerant, but honestly, we don't you know. We don't know. Nobody's, nobody's studied that to my knowledge. So another question that came in, and I'm going to read it. Um, so the question or 
and question and statement. Ecologists know the value beaver dams have in attenuating flood volume. The lay person has been told beaver dams cause or worsen floods when they blow out. Is there research on this subject that one can use to defend leaving beaver dams and reassuring landowners that their fears are misfounded? Mm, yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. I mean, I mean, certainly. Um, well, if you if you if you email me, um, which is which is I, I put my email address in the chat. I, I could I can send you a, a couple of papers about about beavers and beavers and flooding, which is, you know, not to say that that, that blowout thing never happens, you know, I, I mean, there, you know, there have been a, a couple of, you know, very widely publicized inst instances of, you know, beaver dams blowing out and causing, causing property damage, but, you know, I think it's really unusual, um, and, you know, from a, again, from a flood mitigation standpoint, you know, beavers are reducing flooding much more than they're, than they're causing it, so if, you, you know, if, if um, Philip, who asked that question, emails me. I can I can send him a, a study or two about about beavers and, and flood mitigation. Wonderful. So I think those are all the questions that I see in the chat, and I'm wondering if anybody uh, that hasn't had a chance to put a question in the chat wants to speak up and ask a question. Let's see, I, th I see that a couple people have just raised their hands. Let me see if I can. So, hmm. I'm not seeing, I think there was a Jonathan. Jonathan, do you, oh, Jonathan, and do you want, and Charlene, do you want to ask your question on mute? I recently heard on the radio, can you hear me all right? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Um, I recently heard on the radio that beavers are starting to move into the Arctic tundra. And uh, I wonder if you know anything about that and whether that's, I mean, it, apparently it's um, uh, melting the, the permafrost, their ponds are melting the perm permafrost. And obviously that's not something we want to have happening, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's probably just more of a, a, a sign of the climate change than anything else. But do you know anything about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so that's a, a, a good, a good question. And you know, I mean, honestly, one of one of my pet peeves, you know, is that is that I mean, right? All the time now, you see articles about uh, you know beavers, beavers melting the permafrost and you know damming the tundra. Um, and uh, you know, <laughs> I don't think that beavers are the Arctic's biggest problem when it comes to climate change. Um, I mean, I, I think that you know. The, the, I guess the other thing I would say um, is that, so as you say, you know, beavers are moving north. Uh, well, so I mean, a couple of things. First, you know, it's possible that beavers were historically native, um, you know, to that, that part of the Arctic and they got trapped out and, and now they're recolonizing their former range. We actually don't know if that's, you know, if this is a kind of a new colonization or a recolonization. Um, so I'll say that. And the second thing I'll say is that, you know, as you pointed out, they're, they're moving north because the, the, the tree line is moving north, right? There are willows you know, encroaching or moving into the Arctic and beavers just following the willows. Um, and, you know, we know that there are lots of organisms that are moving north because of climate change, right? Wolves are doing that. Salmon are, you know, are moving into Arctic rivers. They've never been present before. Um, you know, moose uh, are, you know, a great example of a species that's moving north. You know, they're obviously being uh, basically desanguinated by ticks in, in Vermont and, you know, in, in much of their historic range in New England. And, you know, these are all, I mean, wolves, salmon, moose, you know, these are all animals that benefit from the presence of beavers and that are going to have to move north anyway. So because I'm a shameless beaver apologist, you know, the way I think about it is beavers are making migration possible for species that are going to have to move anyway, right? They're, you know, they're agents of climate change adaptation, not, uh, you know, not, not destruction. Um, so again, I'm a beaver apologist, but, you know, but I, I feel like, uh, right, Arctic's got bigger problems than beavers, um, and you know, they, they might even be beneficial in, in some ways. Uh, Stephen, John? I think you have to unmute. All right, I forgot, sorry. Uh, yeah, I remember reading an article that I, I saw, taught uh, science for quite a long time. And um, anyway, uh, this, the, there was an experiment done. Uh, why, why do beavers uh, 
damn where they do or uh, and they're clearly somewhat motivated by uh, water running uh, trickling water I mean they're always preparing their dams wherever they're leaking right so the story is at, at least as I got it that they set up a, a speaker out in the middle of a field a dry field and you know some beavers came out there and uh, and uh, put started building a dam around the speaker. Now, I, is that possible? I mean, is that just apocryphal or is that really true? What motivates the beaver? No, it's, it, that, that, is, that is a true story. There was, it was, um, I forget where he's from, but he was a Scandinavian biologist did that in, in the 1960s, I think, where he basically, he actually put a speaker in, in the floor of a concrete walled room. Um, and, uh, and took a couple, a couple of young beavers. So beavers, so beavers who had never, you know, he actually separated beavers from their parents uh, from birth, essentially, kind of an unkind thing to do. Um, but you know, so there, there are beavers who had never, you know, seen or been around a dam building before. Um, and when he, put, when he put them in this room, the sound of running water, they, they built dams on the speaker in the floor of the room. Um, so that's, you know, so, so, so that's, I think that, that that study tells us a couple of things. I mean, first, right, that, that you know that there is an acoustic um, trigger, uh, at least to some extent, to, to dam building, uh, and also that you know, again, to some extent, that you know, the, the dam building behavior is is innate, right? There, you know, certainly yeah. they're, you know, they're, they spend a lot of time, you know, watching their older siblings and their parents, and they you know they certainly learn um, from their their elders, but you know, to the the, the basic dam building drive is you know is clearly hardwired to some extent um so yeah i don't know pa i mean patty you've, what, what's your what's your experience with these these animals what 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 makes them do what they do well i have noticed that um during high water events when water is just pouring over a dam the beavers aren't the least bit concerned about uh building during during those times um, but they do go out and, and scout along the surface of the dam. If it's, if the water is dropping at all and build it all up. So the dam stays nice and level with the, the water level. Yeah. So I think it's, it's a little more nuanced than that they hear running water and they build a dam, but I will, I'll also just add to Ben's uh, story to say that the beavers that I'm rehabilitating right now who have never experienced um, dams or lodges, at least one of them, <laughs> knew exactly how to go about building a lodge and making a food cache when they were, they had the opportunity to do that this fall. So it's just interesting to note how much of that they, they have hardwired in there. Yeah. Thank you. So we have a few more questions that have come in through the chat. So one of the questions is, in your book, you tell some good stories about beaver reintroduction in the UK and other degraded parts of the world. Any updates on that progress? Yeah, good, good question. Right. So, this, so the story in the UK is, you know, is basically that it's a, a, similar, a somewhat similar story um, to beavers here, with the difference being that um, beavers were eliminated completely from, from the UK. Um, so they were totally extinct. Um, and they were, you know, they wiped out much earlier too. You know, the, the, the beavers have been absent from, from the UK for about 400 years, um, but you know, they have recently been reintroduced there um, through a, a combination of, you know, official authorized re reintroductions and, you know, some kind of rogue rewilders who sort of took matters into their, their own hands and, and released some. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, you know, they're, 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 doing, they're doing really well. They're, you know, they're, they're flourishing, they're reproducing like crazy. Um, and you know, every I mean every month it seems like you know, there's another another beaver trial somewhere in, in England or Scotland where you know they're, they're some conservation group is you know is, is introducing another another colony of beavers um, you know mostly using German German stock um, and you know and and their I mean, situation is basically that you know there are lots of beavers behind fences, right? There are, left, there are all of these, you know, all of these, these enclosures on a big estate somewhere, you know, where beavers can be, you know, sort of wild, but they can't necessarily, you know, disperse out um, and do their own thing. And that's, you know, that's sort of the next phase that has to happen is, is we, you know, we've got to, or at least British conservationists have to, you know, take down a lot of these fences um, and, and let beavers be truly wild on, on the landscape. And, and that hasn't really happened yet. 
So um, another question okay, that came up is, do beavers have issues with ticks or does their aquatic nature and dense fur help mitigate them? Uh, I've never heard about beavers in Seattle. Patty, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, actually we do have a, a beaver tick, a tick that specializes on beavers. And I've, one of the beavers in my stream became badly infested once and uh, Skip Lyle reported a similar thing. I was able to treat the beaver that was in my brook. So I don't know if they can be lethal the way they are with moose, but I wouldn't be surprised. Hmm crazy living underwater and still they manage and maybe it's because the beaver's fur is is so dense that is incredible that one it can get to the skin and <laughs> yeah. that it would can live with the water so there's been a lot of been just a lot of wonderful comments about how either people who didn't know a lot about beavers learned so much or people who knew a lot about beavers and have learned even more and just so appreciative. And one of these people also had a question and said, what advice do you, do you have for towns and local road commissioners in New England that are dealing with flooded roads and other human beaver infrastructure conflicts? Talk to Skip. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the great, I mean, to me, the great thing about, about living in New England is that, is that you know, the, I mean, really the, the two leading authorities on, on you know, non-lethal beaver conflict mitigation are, are Skip Lyle uh, in Vermont and, and Mike Callahan um, in, in Massachusetts, you know, and, and both of those guys, you know, have, um, yeah, they, you know, they, they have a wealth of experience um, and, you know, they're always, uh, I think they're, they're generally looking for new clients. So, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, a, you know, a road manager um, concerned, about, concerned about beaver conflicts, then, you know, Mike, Mike and Skip are, are the, the, the people to talk to. I mean, I would say that you know that that more generally, um, I think I think that the really the important thing to keep in mind is that you know is that trapping is this ongoing process, right? You know, every year you you, you need to you know you need to do it again and again, um, and you know, and there are all of these communities that have this that have these long-standing contracts with trappers. It's just like you know, it's it's like a line item, um, you know, that nobody even notices, and that, you know, they just sign off on. It's like okay, we're going to pay this guy you know a thousand bucks a year to trap out our culverts. Uh, and you know nobody even really thinks about it, um, but you know that 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 adds up, right? Uh, you know it ends up being really expensive to trap out uh, beavers at culverts every single year. You know if you're a small town or or you know or a county, whereas you know a well-made beaver deceiver or another another flow device, you know costs you you know a couple thousand bucks, let's say, to build it once and then essentially forget about it. Um, you know, and and so that's that's one of the things. You know, there's there's a great study of, of skips beaver deceivers. Um, he he put in a he put a bunch in, in in Virginia for the Virginia Department of Transportation. And you know, I forget the exact numbers, but it was something like you know every every dollar that that VDOT spent on beaver deceivers, you know, returned something like nine dollars um, in avoided road maintenance and trapping costs. Um, so you know, we're all you know, I think that we're all beaver believers. Uh, on this on this uh, this call, um, so you know we want beavers around for their own ecological sake. But you know even if you're a, a you know a county commissioner or a town manager concerned strictly with you know costs and benefits, um, you know beaver deceivers and the like really pay for themselves and, and then some. So there are just so many wonderful reasons to you know to to take a non lethal approach. And and uh, I think there's an argument in there for everybody. So, um, oh, Lawrence, do you have a question? Yeah, yes, I do. Uh, uh, ben, uh, can you tell us anything about beavers uh, in terms of a colony? In other words, territorially, how do they get along with other beavers? That they, may, in other words, are are they better at it than maybe humans uh, at getting along? And uh, because I remember that some of the uh, lodges they built, they actually would have two family groups in them. There'd be, there'd be one family group and there'd sometimes be another family group uh, sharing that same lodge. So thank you. Hmm. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. I, you know, I, I would say that, they're, that unfortunately they're not good at getting, getting along. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're very territorial animals and, and uh, okay. 
you know, they, they will, I mean, they, they certainly do uh, fight, um, you know, if, if one of those dispersing juveniles, you know, enters the territory of an established colony, um, you know, the, the, the uh, established beavers will, you know, will, will run them off and, and um, you know, they, I mean, certainly fights to the death even happen occasionally, I think. Um, you know, as for the, as for the observation of two, co of two families, you know, inhabiting one lodge, um, you know, it's, I mean, certainly, I mean, they're very familial animals, right? So, so you know, so to me, I mean, Patty would probably answer this question better than I can, but, you know, it's, to me, I mean, like reading, you know, reading books like, like, uh, you know, like, like Lily Pond, Hope Ryden's book, you know, she, I mean, she documents, you know, lots of sort of unconventional family structures, you know, like a brother and a sister, um, sort of like platonically uh, raising their, uh, you know, their younger siblings together. Um, so it could be, you know, that what seemed like two families in one lodge was actually, you know, maybe it was, maybe it was, uh, you know, two, two sets of siblings or something like that um, living together. But so, you know, so I think that we like, we have sort this, of an extended family, in other extended words. Family. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I think we have this conception of like a, a beaver colony, you know, being the, you know, the mommy and the daddy and the, you know, the, the three kids, when in reality, you know, I think that they, like they have some, more unconventional arrangements sometimes. And I don't know, Patty, what's your, what's, what's been your experience? Yeah, I would, I would say that that is definitely true and would also agree that it's very likely that they're all related individuals. I've been told that the beavers can recognize relatives that they have never met before by their smell yeah. and have a and will be less aggressive with those beavers, but they do have to be very territorial because there are just a limited number of places where beavers can settle. So they've got to defend their territory once they get it. So in the chat, there is also, there's kind of a story about um, 20 some years ago, there was a huge storm up north that blew out a gigantic dam in Rygate, Rygate, Vermont. Turned, into a, turned a multi-acre pond into a marsh, and downstream there were dam fragments 12 to 15 feet up into the trees. And I just wanted to comment that um, I do think sometimes what I hear from towns is concerns that there are, there was a case actually just uh, several years back of a dam blowout in Westminster that took out large portions of the road in the neighboring town to the south um, because it was near the border and it washed out huge sections of the road as the dam burst. Turns out that a human had augmented the beaver dam with sandbags mm. to raise the beaver dam and then the beavers built on top of the sandbags and it was sort of the instability of the sandbags that blew out the dam. But wow. um, the beavers were framed. <laughs> so I think, you know, as in the Northeast, one of, you know, I think what comes into people's minds about beaver dams is as we get more rain in intense bursts, we're seeing more pressures and like flash flooding on our streams. And therefore, maybe we'll see more beaver dam blowouts. I, I have not heard, besides this one in the Westminster area, one that has affected human infrastructure to such a degree on a regular basis. I think beaver dams in general are very sturdy and well-made. Sometimes as beavers abandon an area and a dam degrades, sometimes you see a little bit more issue, but usually it's a slow degradation over time and the slow release of the water. But I just want to, you know, I, I hear that kind of question a lot, especially as we see more intense flooding. Um, yeah. But There's, we don't see it in the landscape a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I certainly, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you. And, you know, I think that a, a great piece of evidence for that, that idea that it's, you know, really a slow degradation rather than a catastrophic process. There's, you know, this wonderful, um, you know, wonderful story in, involving, there's a kind of a, um, a beaver observer and anthropologist in, in Michigan in the 1850s, I want to say, certainly like mid 19th century, who basically, you know, he made these amazing, very detailed maps uh, of beaver, beaver dams and ponds um, in, in northern Michigan. 
and uh, you know, 160 years later, um, you know, when when researchers looked at aerial photographs, you know, they saw they saw that all of those all of those ponds that had been documented in the mid 19th century were still present on the landscape. You know, these, these are just like incredibly right, very well made dams, very stable features. Um, you know, I think that that the kind of the catastrophic dam blowout is is really unusual. So we only have a few minutes left and um, I don't see anything more in the chat in terms of questions. Does anyone who um, has not written a question have one that they'd like to ask? Stephen? Yeah, I, I'd just like to say thank you very much. It was very well uh, put together, very informative and um, greatly appreciate what you do. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, thanks a lot for being part of it. Uh, Lawrence? Are you going to continue to uh, work as, an, uh, as a life project on this, Ben? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I can't, um, you know, I can't, I can't escape it, Lawrence, at this point. You know, no, it's, it's um, yeah, of course, I, you know, I think that once, you know, as so many people can 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 testify, you know, once you once you uh, you know once you get involved in beavers, it's 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 hard to shake them. You know, they just they just uh, they they have this way of sinking their little web web time feet into you. Um, but uh, I don't I don't have any more beaver books planned. But you know, I certainly I, I do lots of you know beaver advocacy. I'm on the board of a of a group here in, in Washington that does that does uh, you know a lot of beaver relocation and and um, you know, non-lethal coexistence. So certainly I, you know, I think that beavers will always be always be part of my life uh, in life uh, here later. And uh, I'm sure Patty feels the same way. So before we get to so Steve get Gang's to Steve question, Gang's I, uh, I just uh, wanted to point out the chat point that Marilyn said, said, we want beaver we want believer, beaver believer pals and t-shirts. T-shirts. Great documentary called yeah, the Beaver Believers by a, a wonderful guy named Sarah Konsberg. And she, if you if you if you just Google Beaver Believers film, that'll take you to her website. And if you say Beaver Believer, it's out there. It's out there. Wow. I'm sorry, I'm getting I'm a lot sorry. of feedback on myself. I'm gonna mute myself gonna and mute Steve, myself. maybe you can wrap Steve, up the question and answer. answer. <laughs> well, that's a, more of an honor than I deserve. I just wanted to say thanks to Ben. Uh, I shouldn't be surprised that this is such a informative, articulate talk because your book was so delightfully written and informative. Um, and I think you answered the question I was going to ask, which is what are you writing now? But maybe there's uh, something other than beavers. Um, yeah, and, and Steve, I just want to say th thanks so much for being part of this, and I'll, and thanks for saying that. And you know, Steve, Steve is actually a plant. Steve, um, Steve's son Jeff was my college one of my college roommates. So I I, I was happy to see Steve in the audience, and um, thanks for thanks for saying that, and good to good to virtually see you. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on uh, my next book now, which is actually, you know, another topic that kind of intersects with Patty's life in some ways, I think. Um, I'm writing a book about the science of road ecology. So basically how roads impact nature and how we can kind of manage or, or mitigate those impacts. So, you know, a lot of it is about habitat connectivity and, you know, wildlife crossing structures. I'm sure you've all seen pictures of, uh, you know, bridges and tunnels meant to get animals safely uh, over or under roads. Um, so that's a lot of what the book's about, is about, um, about, you know, how we can kind of make our infrastructure lie more lightly on the land. And, uh, and I just, I, I turned in a first draft a few weeks ago, and I'm still waiting for feedback from the editor. Um, but, you know, I hope that'll be out in, I don't know, maybe uh, sometime in the 21st century, maybe, maybe next year. I hope next year. <laughs> Well, Ben, this has been incredible. And if you have a chance to look at the chat, there's just so much appreciation uh, for the information you shared and about your presentation in general. And thank you very much for joining the Green River Watershed Alliance this evening. And um, thank you for sharing your enthusiasm and your knowledge about beavers and their importance in the landscape. It's certainly an important topic that um, here in New England, people are thinking about on a regular basis.
So uh, for those of you that are joining us, I just want to point out that Patty has been working on providing some resources for the Green River Watershed Alliance faith, or website. It's not available yet, but um, give it a couple of weeks and pretty soon you will be able to find on the Green River Watershed Alliance um, website, a whole resource section dedicated to beavers. So thank you, Ben, and thank you, Patty. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Margo. Thanks, Margo. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. So appreciate your email, Patty. Thank you. <laughs>